I'm really happy that Adam talked as much as he did about diversity, because I'm sort of going to take on this term inclusion a little bit. Um, and the way that I'd like to do that, if it works for you guys, is to tell you a story about um, the research I did uh, that became the book Digital Dead End, uh, Fighting for Social Justice in the Information Age. Um, and I think it offers some really interesting lessons about inclusion. Particularly, it offers some great lessons about some really bad mistakes I made. Um, and uh, I hope that we can all sort of think together about learning from those mistakes and if and how they apply to your own situation. Um, so a couple of things that you need to understand about my work. Uh, probably the most important thing is that um, the book, Digital Dead End, is based on um, four years of participatory action research. Um, and what that means generally is just that you do research with people rather than on them. Um, so instead of engaging in research um, with human beings like you would with lab rats, you go into communities that have problems or stay in your own community and um, think about its problems, ask people what they know about those problems, and help them figure out ways um, to create smart, sustainable, lasting, um, solutions that go to the go to the root, right? Um, so this doesn't really seem like uh, any great innovation. It seems pretty common sensey to me that people closest to problems probably have the best information about them, are probably most invested in creating smart solutions that will last. Um, strangely enough, uh, in the academy, this is like crazy talk, right? People are like, "You're asking people what to ask about? That's nuts, right? That's that's what we do." Um, so I think that um, uh, doing research in this sort of weird, fringy way um, actually led to some um, interesting situations and some interesting insights that might be relevant to the kind of work that you guys do. Um, and the second thing that it's important to understand about this work is that I came from a background um, that included a lot of work in the Community Technology Center movement. And Community Technology Centers, uh, there's fewer of them now, though U Media uh, at the Chicago Public Library is a really good example of it. Um, but there was a sort of a moment in the mid-90s to, to early 2000s uh, where there was a push to create these sort of standalone media centers um, that were used by youth and adults um, who lacked access to technology to sort of pick up technology skills. Um, to talk about the kinds of problems they were facing in their communities and to sort of build knowledge and social movements. And I came out of that uh, tradition um, and am very proud of the work I did in a, a number of different organizations, um, including Plugged In in East Palo Alto, which is right down the road from Stanford. Um, and then when I moved to Troy, New York, um, with an organization there called The Arc. Um, but part of my background, um, both coming out of the Community Technology Center and coming out of the more academic understandings of um, high-tech inequality or um, developing a high-tech equity agenda, um, was that I was really locked in to this idea that probably a phrase you guys are, are familiar with already, this idea of the digital divide, right? Does that still resonate with people, that phrase? So the the idea behind the digital divide is that there are um, a group of people who are technology haves, who've got Blackberries and laptops and um, you know, smartphones and all that stuff, um, and a group of people who are technology have-nots, who lack access to those things. And so the social justice problem there is distribution, right? There's a gap, and particularly in the late 90s and early 2000s, there was a lot of concern that that gap was actually getting bigger rather than smaller. So I was very much sort of caught up in this moment, and I very much had this sort of framework in my head when I started doing the work that forms the basis for this book. And I was lucky enough to find an organization, the YWCA of Troy Cohoes, that was both part of a membership movement, a women's membership movement, to, um, uh, to empower women and girls and to eliminate racism by any means necessary, that was also um, home to 90 poor and working class women um, in my hometown of Troy. And I sort of, you know, with my little academic helicopter, like sort of choppered in and landed, and it was like, oh, I'm here to help. And was very, very lucky that the executive director and some of the staff and also some of the um, great, resourceful, brilliant women who live there sort of sat me down and went, we're not interested in your solutions. <laughs> Um, and I had this moment where I was like, oh, <laughs> what do you mean? Um, and so I want to tell you a little bit about the lessons that I learned from people at the, in the YWCA 
community um, and what it taught me about how we can think better um, about inclusion. Because this whole idea of the digital divide, my idea going in was people lacked access to technology, we could build resources for them, we could do skills training, um, and I could help by um, you know, setting up this infrastructure and setting up this sort of intellectual um, uh, exchange where we would you know, kindly and generously give our important technical knowledge to them. And surprised to find out that I was, of course, completely wrong. Um, and one of the things I'm proudest of in this book is that there's one sentence in there, it's three words long, and it just says, I was wrong. And I think it might be the first time this phrase has ever been um, published in an academic book. <laughs> and I was doing a talk actually in Princeton at Labyrinth Books and the woman who had invited me said, you know Virginia, I think that might be the first time that phrase has been published in a nonfiction book of any kind. <laughs> so this is one of the things I'm proudest of and it's really that sort of moment of deep listening, right? Like Adam talked about, um, where uh, I had to learn to sort of shut up and be there for, um, for their experiences and find out what we could learn together from that. Because contrary to this idea of the digital divide, um, information technology was an absolutely ubiquitous presence in the lives of women who lived in the YWCA of Troy Cohoes community. And just to give you a little bit of background on them, um, the Y is more or less, um, in addition to being a sort of social movement, the, this residential Y uh, more or less runs like a single, single room occupancy hotel, people call them SROs, right? So it's um, sort of dorm room style, kitchen and bathroom down the hall. At the time, that cost about $250 a month. And I'd say 80% of people were also getting some kind of public assistance to stay there. So um, some kind of Section 8 or um, some other kind of supportive housing. So these are people who really, really, really are struggling to meet their basic needs, right? Um, and these are the people that digital divide um, activism or policy making would assume, um, many of them women of color, many of them immigrant women, and many of them some single mothers, um, would assume absolutely have the bottom of the heap for technology access, right? These are the folks who are, have not been reached and need to be reached. Um, and I found out that that wasn't true. Um, in fact, that they had a ton of interaction with technology in their everyday lives. And I just want to give you a sort of a couple of quick examples of what kind of interaction they had and what that meant for my thinking about what the issues are around um, high technology and equity um, in the United States. Um, so despite digital divide policies focus on providing job training, right? That's one of the things we were supposed to do. We were supposed to build infrastructure and provide women um, job training so they could sort of shoehorn themselves into the information economy. They were already there, right? They already had high-tech jobs, but they were low-wage high-tech jobs. So they were working in call centers, they were working in data entry warehouses, um, and the, so the problem wasn't access to high-tech jobs. The problem was the jobs that they were able to get um, paid um, deeply inadequate wages. Um, some of them minimum wage, some of them quite a bit worse than that. One of the women I worked with, um, Jen, who was uh, a member of our sort of um, organizing group, um, which was called WinSim, Women at the YWCA Making Social Movement. Um, she was working overnights for an uh, internet service provider in the area um, doing network administration, and she was being paid $50 a week for um, almost full-time work. So clearly illegal um, um, at wage level. Um, and the reason she was doing it, um, and she knew that this wasn't quite kosher, but the reason she was doing it is she actually loved um, learning about computers so much, and this was one of the only opportunities she had to do it, so she took a basically $1.50 an hour job um, in order to be able to build her skills, right? Um, so wages often weren't adequate and, and sometimes criminal, um, actually criminal. Um, the employment relationship was often temporary and unsustainable for women in the YWCA community, so particularly call centers, right? So call center work often um, runs on swing shifts um, or split shifts. So either you're working overnights or you work from you know, noon to four and then you've got a four hour break and you work from eight to midnight. Right? Really, really difficult, particularly if you're a single parent. In fact, almost impossible to figure out a childcare um, situation there that will make it make sense for you to have that job, unless you have family members who can take care of your children for free, and many people did not. Um, there are a number of negative health impacts, um, visual, auditory, um, sort of particularly stuff around carpal tunnel. Um, this is particularly an issue for pregnant women, um, it turns out, um, that uh, it, it 
this is just because I have a, a friend who was pregnant recently, show, um, came up with um, carpal tunnel and um, was told by her doctor that it's actually because you have more fluid in your body when you're pregnant and it actually puts more pressure on the joints and the nerves um, that are involved in carpal tunnel. And so um, if you're pregnant, you really, really, really have to watch computer use, right? I never heard that, but uh, it turns out to be true. Um, and then finally, the, um, the sort of monitoring and surveillance in these jobs was really intense to the degree that like one member of um, the group that I worked with said that she was working doing, um, entering insurance claims um, a, in a sort of a data warehouse um, situation. And one day she uh, pulled up the internet to check if she had enough money um, to go get lunch, to go buy a sandwich. And um, in her own words, the bloodhounds from the IT department um, were sort of at her desk within minutes and like, what are you doing on company time on the internet? Um, you know, we're gonna dock you five minutes um, for um, so, you know, wasting our time by, by going on the internet to check your bank account. So that's an example, right? Um, my assumption going in is um, people lack access to high-tech jobs. I need to help provide training um, in order to get people to a place where they can get these jobs, right? Turns out, just not true, right? They're, they're already there, um, but it was that the jobs that they were able to get um, were not uh, sustaining um, for them or were um, the employment relationship was so um, difficult for them to manage that many of them um, succeeded in getting high-tech jobs, stayed there as long as they can, and then said, you know what, I'm going back to doing um, basic service work. I'm going back to doing uh, care work for kids. I'm going back to doing sort of industrial food prep um, because the high-tech economy um, works so poorly for them, particularly as, um, as parents. Um, I'll just give you one more example. Um, one of the things we heard a lot about um, the promise of high technology has been around um, e-governance, right? About how uh, information technology is supposed to make our government institutions more accountable and more transparent, um, help us make better decisions with more people. Um, and in fact, what I learned in the uh, YWCA community is rather than ushering in this sort of new age of transparency and accountability, um, women in the YWCA community, one of the places they most often came into contact with um, high tech was in the social service office, was when they were trying to claim benefits um, under welfare, um, uh, under the welfare system. And so um, in, in that system, rather than creating a kind of accountability and transparency, the inclusion of information technology after the welfare reforms in 96 has largely led to the systems that um, uh, that run welfare becoming more obscure, more difficult to figure out, um, and much, much more punitive, right? Um, so many women in the YWCA community were forced to sort of give up um, their personal information, to trade control over their rights as citizens, um, and to give up a lot of decision-making uh, control over how they were gonna meet their needs in their own ways for um, inadequate and often um, demeaning social support from the state. And this process has really been impacted by the um, uh, computerization of the social service office. And I've gone on to do actually quite a lot more work about that and happy to talk about it later. Um, so some of the kinds of stories that people would tell me is that they would go into the social service office coming out of some kind of really tough situation, domestic violence, coming out of an addiction, um, homelessness, um, to try to seek support. And the first thing they would see, we're going to pretend this is a computer, is a caseworker who um, hid behind their computer so they didn't have to make eye contact and would sort of um, say, you're not in the system, and then go back um, sort of behind their monitor, right? Um, and I was um, watching The Wizard of Oz with, I'm staying with some friends, and, and they have a four-year-old daughter named Delilah who is um, delightful. And we were watching The Wizard of Oz the first night I got here, and you know, they get, to the, they get to Oz, and it's been a really hard journey, and there's this huge door in Oz, and then there's a tiny door in the huge door, and the guy with the big mustache comes out of the tiny door, and he's like, go away, and slams the door, right? So the, the computer terminal actually sort of served as that tiny door um, to government, right, to the state, um, and to basic social support for people's families. So when that tiny door slammed shut, when um, people heard, you're not in the system, or um, dealt with uh, voicemail after voicemail after voicemail and couldn't get a response, even though they're having a very serious emergency situation, right? No place to live, no food for their kids. Um, um, you know, fleeing a domestic violence situation, all these things that put people in a place um, to go on public assistance. Um, that, that computer then became sort of a symbol of the door swinging shut 
um, between women in the Y community and the possibilities for help from the government actually was really meaningful for them. That was a really meaningful um, interaction. And it taught them all sorts of lessons, both about technology more generally and about how government works, right? I mean, one of the big struggles we had at the Y was to help people articulate why, why it matters to do any kind of sort of political work, because often that was their um, experience with it. So despite all these stories that we were hearing at the time about um, you know, increased transparency and in, increased accountability and sort of the, the promise of um, information technology to democratize our lives, um, we were seeing it um, operate in a very, very different way um, in, in the lives of women of the YWCA community. Um, and so in the book, I call this sort of the real world of information technology, so a similar phrase to Adam's um, real world of hip hop. Um, so rather than being sort of technology poor in any simple way, women in the Y community had really copious direct experience with technology in their work, in their everyday lives, in their political work, um, and in the workplace. Um, so one of the questions I'm left there is, is both how did I get it so wrong coming in and how did I study this for four or five years and come in with such incredibly mistaken understandings of what was going on in the ground? Um, and, you know, frankly, I think uh, one of the things people have said about this book is, which is incredibly flattering, they've called me sort of the Jane Adams of the digital um, age, and I'm in a Chicago crowd, so you guys um, uh, know Jane. And I think, um, you know, the lesson there about how that mistake happened is a lesson that Jane Adams would appreciate because policymakers and academics were so, dis and even some activists, honestly, were so disconnected from the reality of poor and working class women's lives um, that they couldn't frame the problem in a way that it was actually useful, right? They couldn't frame the problem in a way that was correct or in a way that was gonna end up in solutions that actually have any kind of bearing um, on women in the YWCA's um, lives. Um, and they're really powerful incentives not to ask questions about who pays for technological change um, and who benefits from it. Because I, I, one of the things I argue in the book is we have this um, kind of magical thinking as a culture about technology. Um, and the idea, magical thinking basically is um, common in very small children and schizophrenics. And the idea is if you wish for something hard enough, it will just appear, you know, like if I go to sleep tonight thinking pony, 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 you know, <laughs> in the morning I'll wake up and pony, right? Um, uh, so we have sort of that thinking about technology in American culture, right? We have this idea that the next killer app, like whether it's the internet or nanotechnology or biotechnology or, um, you know, or Twitter or whatever, whatever the next big thing is, is somehow going to manage magically fix all of our political, social, and economic problems. Like the monolith from 2001, A Space Odyssey, is going to come down from space and bam, like evolution, right? Um, and there's a grain of truth in some of those stories, right? Technology has changed our social relationships deeply and in some very positive and progressive ways. Um, but the problem with magical thinking is the idea that sort of Information technology will magically cure our political, social, economic ills sometime in the future when the right app shows up means that we're not actually working on those problems together in the now, right? Um, and so one of the big lessons that comes out of this book is that um, social justice isn't going to happen by accident. It's not going to emerge because of the next new thing in technology. But we have to be doing social justice work um, and technological design, technological innovation, technological change at the same time every time, right? That's one of the sort of one of the big lessons here. Um, so what did we do? Um, at the Y, we uh, developed an approach that I call popular technology. And um, I'm not going to have a lot of time to talk about it um, here today. But the idea is basically rather than teaching technological skills to those that we deem technologically deficient in some way, um, we gather everybody's insight into what it means to be a critical technological um, citizen. And we build structures for talking across difference that make it possible to understand um, other people's relationships with technology that are rooted in their social location, rooted in their um, place in the power structures um, of society. And we built engaged technology projects from there. We started 
from everyday experience. We started from the social justice goals and we built technology projects from there instead of doing it the other way, teaching technology skill, building technology projects, and being like, well, I hope this makes the community better, right? Um, and that, it turned out to make a really big difference in the kind of projects that we developed. Um, and I'm happy to, to tell you about those um, at greater length uh, during the sort of questions and answers. But I do want to talk a little bit about the sort of parallels that I see between my work and, and the kinds of problems you guys might face. Um, one is this question of how policymakers, academics, activists got it so wrong, right? Um, there was a, a, a sort of locked in framework for thinking about technology, what I call in the book the distributive paradigm, right? That if you distribute access to these tools, that'll deal with all the social justice issues, right? Not so, not so much. Um, we really had to challenge that framework and look at um, what other social justice issues were operating at the Y and how we could use technology to sort of interrupt those um, or to help us do the other social justice work that we were doing. So there are bigger issues there. Um, the second thing is the language of inclusion, right? So for me, when I came to the Y community, I was thinking very much, how do we include you know, poor and working women in the great information technology revolution? And they were like, we're here. <laughs> we're just being exploited, right? And that's a different kind of a question, right? How do we create a just information uh, economy is a very different question than how do we include poor and working people in um, uh, the information economy that we have now. Right? And I think that's a really big challenge. And at the end of the book, I have sort of a nine point plan for um, high tech equity that takes into account some of the deeper social justice issues that are working there. But I think that might be something that resonates with your work. Right? How do we um, not just think about bringing people in, but how do we think about challenging the structures that um, make their inclusion a paradox? Right? So there's an Italian philosopher named um, Giorgio, oh, what's his last name? Agamben. Um, oh, did somebody know that one? <laughs> Woohoo! Um, who talks about the paradox of inclusion? And the paradox is um, what does it mean to talk about including people into a system that despises them, right? What does it mean about to include people in a system that exploits them, right? And how do you deal with that conflict? Um, and I'm not saying that um, uh, the corporate culture despises and exploits poor and working people, but I think there might be a similar um, um, struggle that uh, you guys are facing and getting beyond the language of, um, of inclusion. Okay. So I'm really looking forward to talking to you guys some more. Thanks so much for having me.